Good afternoon, everybody at uh, URI 2021. My name is uh, David Julian. I'm the Secretary General for the Inter-American Organization for Higher Education, and welcome to our session called uh, eMovies, uh, Virtual Mobility Alternatives, uh, as um, we are very happy to uh, present what we have done in the Americas to uh, your large audience in the Eurasia region. Um, I am talking today from the north of Montreal in Canada, on ceded territory of the Atikamekw people. And together with me are two colleagues and friends. Uh, first, we have uh, James Aldridge, who's Vice Provost International at Lakehead University. Good morning, James. And also uh, joined uh, by Steve Baiza Abadi. Uh, Director of Interinstitutional Affairs at Universidad Católica Santísima Concepción down in Chile. All right, so uh, without much more introduction, I will start my presentation. Here we are. So um, just a, a quick word about IOHE. Uh, we are uh, as I was saying, based in Montreal. Uh, the organization is 40 years old, so it's pretty consolidated. We're the only organization uh, for higher education that is active in every region of the Americas. So our office is in the north side in Canada, but we have members all the way down if we take the, the United States, Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, down to Patagonia with Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and, and many other countries. Uh, we're driven by collaboration, focusing on innovation, equity, and sustainable partnership. Uh, and it's a strong network of uh, members uh, we have more than 350 universities and colleges who are part of the organization. And if you look at our governance structure, uh, you see that we would have uh, nine regions total. So that's a bit the background for you to understand that we work as a region, as a continent. And when the pandemia started, we had an initiative. So, and that's what we want to talk to you about today. Uh, if you look at e-movies, I have to say it comes from the Spanish acronym, which is Espacio de Movilidad Virtual en Educación Superior, which literally means uh, the virtual mobility space in higher education. So we kept the, 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 the Spanish acronym because it works in Portuguese, it works in French, and we actually felt it, it was uh, a, a nice acronym rather than, than the one in, in English. So what is uh, e-movies? Uh, I was saying that we had uh, a pilot uh, in uh, Colombia starting in 2017, 2018. Uh, some of our members were concerned when you look at international uh, mobility and, and the profile of students that are actually able to join uh, this kind of experience, uh, some institutions were concerned that because they were in the provinces, because they were working with students with different type of revenues or responsibilities, some were mothers or fathers of, of young families, they were not necessarily available or able to join uh, the international venture. Uh, they were concerned about issues of equity and access and wanted to grant opportunities to more students to join in uh, some type of international, uh, internationalization and, and mobility. So they were keen in moving forward discussions with their Ministry of Education to get some kind of formal recognition of virtual mobility experiences as part of their uh, mobility program. So we basically set up a pool of 15 higher education institutions who started sharing some courses uh, and Basically, we were working very low key, just sharing a, a big Excel document in the drive that everyone had access. And the responsibles from each of these 15 institutions developed a mechanism where they could invite their students to take online courses in different countries. So then a year ago, uh, COVID-19 uh, kicked in, if I may say, uh, and, and we quickly realized that we had a validated methodology as an alternative to traditional mobility. So. Uh, responding to the request of the Colombians and our, uh, based on our strong network across all regions, we decided to take this little pilot and make it a big project across all of our membership across all the continents. So 
Uh, I will quickly present what is now eMovies, how it operates, and I will give this, the, the, the mic to two of my colleagues who represent two institutions who are part of the consortium, so for them to share a little bit their experience. So, as I was saying, uh, eMovies is an alternative to traditional mobility models. Uh, we make it available to all of our members. We're actually now opening doors to include other type of institutions in the consortium. The logic is the following. Each institution will make available a number of online courses. So let's say uh, I'm here at University of Montreal. We are interested in joining. I would say, look, I will open five of my online courses. And in each of these courses, uh, I will secure two spots uh, for students coming in from foreign countries from partner universities. So that five courses, two students each, makes a total of 10 potential students that I am keen to host. In exchange for what? We will provide you 10 tickets, if you may, uh, to send your students to study in other institutions of their choice who are part of the consortium. So based on what you offer, you then provide the same number of registration uh, to your students out of the pool of courses that is available. So students will then be able to select the courses they want by specific country, specific team, or whatever they are interested in. So that's a little bit the principle. Um, of course, uh, the objective on a really short-term perspective is to provide an alternative to the current no mobility situation. We know that uh, health and security restrictions really don't encourage uh, international travel. So most of the programs are now frozen. So we, we can at least help institutions to continue with some kind of mobility as we are speaking. But beyond what will be the COVID uh, pause, if I may say, or, or, or uh, post-COVID uh, situation, we're, we're convinced that midterm and long-term, we will keep that program. Why? Because it allows institutions to promote study abroad experiences to a different student profile. I was saying that we know some students are working part-time to pay part of their tuition. They cannot leave for three months or six months. Uh, they have a lack of appetite for international uh, travel. Uh, uh, so it, it then guarantee that you can start developing new kind of partnerships. In terms of your in own institution, you can develop with uh, universities or colleges that are not part of your traditional pool of partners. Uh, you will maintain or even increase both your inbound and outbound mobility experiences. And uh, that's a concrete opportunity to reinforce internationalization at home initiatives. So um, we're also convinced that uh, although virtual mobility will never be the same as a traditional experience where you take the plane, discover a new country, new culture, new language. Uh, we are convinced that there are some intercultural awareness that could be raised and, and, and learned in uh, uh, learning, uh, virtual learning environments. Uh, students can develop their global citizenship skills, expand their network, develop second language opportunities, and so on. So um, a, a bit of details on how it works. I don't want to get too technical, of course, but we work with specific calls. So before a specific semester, we will guarantee that we coordinate. So all institutions will make available their pool of courses in our in our platform. And what is our role? We now have 85 institutions, part of eMovies. We don't want each institution to sign a, a bilateral MOU with each of the 44, four, 84 other institutions. So we provide some kind of a program protocol, one common MOU with the same terms of reference for all, setting out the different conditions or requirements or commitments that are inherent, inherent to the program. And we work on mutual reciprocity principles. So trying to change a, a little bit the rules of the game uh, rather than and being stuck with tuition or registration uh, protocols, uh, we work on mutual reciprocity, meaning that in exchange for receiving students, I can send my students, but we don't necessarily have to go through the full registration process. Of course, it does not compensate from the possible loss institutions are facing by the lack of international students coming in in the current situation. However, we believe that for internationalization strategy, partnership development, 
it actually provides an opportunity. Uh, we need to guarantee that students who are part of eMovies will receive their full credits for the courses they complete. And at the end, uh, each institution will be able to define how many courses they want to put in, if they focus on outbound mobility for sending these students students abroad or if they're much more interested in receiving students in, in inbound mobility. So in a nutshell, that's how it works. Uh, basically, it's a fully fledged and international virtual exchange program. Um, what else I can say, if you're interested to, to know a little bit more, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, that's our website and you can see the link. So go into programs and there's a subsection that says eMovies and then you will have the full description, the protocol, all details. Um, and basically what we have done is that I was saying we were working low key. Now we're a bit more professional in the way we're developing that. We set up a full website. So that's basically our website where administrators will have the secure access where they, where they can log in, upload their courses, and then students will be able to serve the website and do their research by university, by courses, by country, by language, etc. cetera. Uh, basically just as a, a big database that is web-based, right? So in 2020, uh, interestingly, in six months or so, we managed to get 85 uh, higher education institutions from 13 countries. You have 12 there, but we actually just added Paraguay. Um, there's a pool of above 4,000 courses in uh, our catalog. And we managed to have uh, more than 1,000 students moving last year. So either going somewhere or uh, being received in, in one institution. So we're pretty excited about those, those statistics. There's already at least 15 institutions. So we're getting very close to 100. Uh, you have the list of countries there. And, and the idea of us presenting today uh, with you guys is to share that, well, it's one new model that is working in one specific region, but we're interested in building bridges with other regions. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll just skip that one. Um, and basically, uh, th that's I, what I wanted to share in terms of a general overview. Uh, and uh, we're obviously keen to receive your questions. So the, the way we structured the session, what I'm interested in, in sharing with the audience is also the voice of two of the institutions that are part of eMovies. We set it up as an organization, but we felt it was important to hear uh, those who were actually part of the program to, to experience that, what has been the process internally, what has been the pros and cons of their journey. It's, it is a, an adventure. We're up, updating that, that platform as we speak, and, and it's a work in progress, so feedback is always interesting. So I would first invite the Vice Provost International from Lakehead University in Ontario, Canada, to share his thoughts. So, James, uh, you, you'll have the mic. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone this morning. I'm going to take uh, about 10 minutes or so here to just introduce you to our situation at Lakehead University. And I'm going to share my screen now uh, so that hopefully you can see that. Okay, I hope everyone can see my presentation there. I'm just going to quickly make it full screen and you should be ready to go. Okay, um, so just quickly before I jump in, I wanna tell you about my university. So we are Lakehead University. We're located in Thunder Bay and Aurelia, Ontario, two campuses, a total of just under 9,000 students and 17% of, of our students are international and 14% are local indigenous students. Um, we had a student mobility program for a number of years now, but it's it's quite small, um, but but was growing until uh, until the pandemic. Um, before COVID, we had a number of online courses, online delivery courses, but no true virtual mobility program. And then, of course, COVID changed everything for us. A little bit about the history of student mobility in Canada. Traditionally, in Canada the level of participation in study abroad has been very low. Um, overall, we're even lower than the United States in terms of the number of students that participate in mobility. Um, and this is something that is uh, on, on the radar or on the minds of a lot of people, including the federal government. At Lakehead University, the national average, we, sorry, at Lakehead University, the mobility average was even lower than our national average. Um, and, at the federal government level, they recognize the importance of global fluency for the future of jobs for Canadians. And so in the last federal government budget, they included 85 million Canadian dollars, so about 70 million US dollars over five years to develop an international student mobility program. 
This was delayed by COVID-19, but they have gone ahead um, with some of their planning initiatives and, and uh, working on being ready for when actual um, physical travel is possible again. So in the background, we're working on a number of, of initiatives and spending some money on preparing for um, the opening of this and, and the funding that's going to come from our government. Universities Canada, which is our consortium of universities in Canada, as well as the colleges and institutes body in Canada, um, administer the program, and the Canadian Bureau of International Education assists with that program. So our involvement um, of eMovies began quickly with the pause on mobility caused by COVID-19. Virtual mobility meant that we would be able to continue to, to build into our programming some cultural intelligence and global competency uh, for our students. And we saw this as a great opportunity. We saw it as an opportunity to maintain and possibly even grow interest in mobility and to serve underrepresented groups. Because as you saw, we have 14% Indigenous students. These students have traditionally not uh, taken on international mobility opportunities for a number of reasons um, and, and just local students as well who, who um, maybe financially had the means to do mobility but just didn't have the recognition of the importance of it or the need for it and so um, I think the eMovies platform and virtual mobility has opened up uh, sort of a new window of opportunity for those students. Lakehead University jumped in from the beginning and we selected five of our courses in business, indigenous studies, history, and environmental sustainability. Um, and we offered two seats per course in those areas. So we offered a total of 10 seats uh, so that our uh, students from partner institutions within the IOHE family could come and take those courses at Lakehead. We received four applications in the very first round um, and for those 10 spots. And, Albeit that was lower than we had hoped originally, um, the program got going very quickly and we're confident that in subsequent rounds, in future rounds, that the, the numbers are going to be increasing. Three of those applications were for a business course and one of them didn't meet the requirements, but in the end, um, we had uh, three course registrations were taken up and we had three, three students uh, do, do, a, do a course with us in, the, in our fall semester, which is September to December. I just want to introduce to you some of the challenges and considerations uh, if you're thinking about this kind of a program. One of the challenges is how to introduce the course in a way that um, students will understand the offering and take up the opportunity. This was a very new concept for students. The idea, even, even explaining to faculty and other staff about the idea, they would say, wait, virtual mobility? How, how does that work? And we would say, well, it's like, you know, you're staying at home in your same office or your same bedroom, but you're having an opportunity to take a course with other students in another country. Um, and one of the things that we enjoyed about it was the flexibility where um, in, if you were doing a, a real life physical mobility, you, you would typically go to another country and take a full course load. In this, um, in this platform, we allow students to take as little as one course from a partner. So they could take four courses from Lakehead and one course from a partner institution and still do some, some form of mobility. And this was quite attractive for students. Um, language proficiency uh, in other languages, particularly Spanish uh, for this region uh, was a challenge. Lakehead University does not have uh, um, a, a big cohort of language students. And so um, looking for partners where there were English taught courses uh, was a problem, there, there are not too many. Um, and then finding students who were proficient enough in a foreign language like Spanish to do the program uh, was a challenge. I don't imagine you would have the same challenges in the European framework, um, but, I, but I'm not sure about that. Um, so how do you get people to, to pivot quickly? And by pivot, I mean change their thinking so that they're ready to take on this kind of activity. I think this was a challenge for us a year ago and even last summer. Now that we've been in the pandemic for nearly a year, I hope that the idea of doing virtual mobility online activities and lessons by Zoom is, is uh, not so foreign to people now. So we started by reaching out to various faculty members uh, we got some, some buy-in there and we were able to support, uh, you know, sort of pushing the program through some key members and faculty. Ultimately, though, we failed to get our students to participate in the outbound portion of the program last fall. 
that was a disappointment. But um, given the nature of, uh, of, of some of the mobility trends in Canada and our, at our institution, it wasn't too surprising. Um, I, I'm much more positive about the prospects for the future of this as we continue with the pandemic here. I do think um, we've raised the uh, raised sort of the um, awareness of this program and that in the future it will be easier to get students. We were very rushed at the begin, beginning. We didn't have enough time to promote it. Um, and we also had faculty who were swamped with the reality of moving to online teaching. Um, and all of the challenges that online teaching and the examination process was bringing to them, that, that um, there was this feeling in the public and in the, in the media and the press that, that everyone just sort of sits at home and it's all easy to do. And in fact, we found that faculty were, were twice as busy as ever before. And so um, getting them to commit to an, an extra initiative like mobility was, was a little difficult at first. There were some course design issues because of the online reality and, of course, budget constraints. Um, our university suffered a small decrease in the number of international students, but even a small decrease was very significant to our budgets and it became difficult to fund anything. So I just have a few um, points of advice or adjustments that I would suggest people do. First of all, be strategic. Know who your champions are on campus. That means know the, know the people that um, would get behind this and are keen on doing this kind of initiative, not necessarily just the program chairs, although they're, they're important to us. It's key, the, the heads of each program are, are key, but, um, but also know who might, who might buy into this kind of a program. We found too that getting messaging from the very top, from our university president and the provost about sort of addressing the new reality and the importance of continuing mobility during the pandemic was very helpful. Um, and we developed a working group together with international relations, our mobility team, the international uh, admissions team, and then our teaching and learning group and our faculty. So that, that working group together helped to sort of map out how we would do this program. Um, developing best practices to support faculty on how to best do virtual mobility was important. And then promote, promote, promote. Um, the awareness for students of the availability of such a program was really key to us. I think uh, if I if if I do this again, we're as I do this again in another round now, we're we're um, finding a, a better social media campaign and more regular messaging to students. And lastly, I'll just men mention in terms of um, incentives. Uh, obviously, providing funding is not as difficult because you're not paying for a plane ticket or, or a stay, um, but providing any funding that you can for, um, for faculty to help arrange this kind of a program. And then we have something in Canada called the co-curricular record. This is, uh, um, if it's familiar to you, it's the idea where in addition to the academic record, you have a parallel record called the co-curricular record where students um, record uh, other activities outside of the classroom, um, like mobility opportunities, and we made sure that uh, we stressed uh, that virtual mobility opportunities would also count on the student's co-curricular record. So that was another incentive for students. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you for listening. Um, I'll just mention that this photo was taken on my iPhone about two weeks ago, uh, very near my house here in Thunder Bay, and that's what we call the sleeping giant. That's the sunrise on Lake Superior, the largest lake in the world. So thank you very much, uh, and uh, goodbye from Thunder Bay. Thank you, uh, James, for, for your presentation. Uh, if you can please stop your, your screen sharing, thank you. And uh, I just want to reflect that uh, the, the, on what you mentioned. You need to know your champions when you move with faculty and, and, and specific courses. We also need to know our champions. Lakehead was the first Canadian institution to, to be part of the consortium, hence the, the rush uh, as they made it possible to join. And we insisted that we, we needed uh, institutions to be part in the early stages. Why? Because it was new and we needed to pilot it from A to Z to actually better understand where are the challenges, where are uh, the specific uh, actions that need to be taken. You talked about promotion and awareness, that's key. And we are now working more. And we, we got testimonials from teachers, from students to try to make it real. And, and actually people can share their experiences, but we, we're confident that the next round uh, will, will actually increase in terms of, of stats. And we've seen that with those who were part of the pilot who started with the same limited numbers, five, six, eight, ten 10 mobilities. Some institutions now have more than 50 students either in or out as part of the program. So it's definitely growing quickly. 
All right, so we'll move to our second speaker, uh, Steve Baiza in Concepcion in uh, Chile. So Steve, you have the mic to share your thoughts. Thank you, David. Good afternoon. Good morning to all. Um, it's a pleasure to be at the Eurasia Higher Education Summit. Uh, be it uh, virtually, uh, which is the new reality. Hopefully, in the future, we can all be in uh, in uh, Istanbul or, or in a summit uh, around those areas. So I'll be um, sharing my screen now uh, with you. Um, and just like um, colleague there, James mentioned, uh, it's my turn to to be able to discuss with you all. Um, the experience that we have had from uh, Chile uh, regarding e-movies. Um, it's been a learning experience like most of you, this whole virtual experience and exchange. Um, in order to, uh, and for, for some of you who may not know about the higher education um, system or context here in, in Chile, I wish to just quickly give you some quick um, numbers here and, and show you some statistics um, in terms of um, mobility pre-COVID um, and, and then obviously lead into um, specifics about our uh, contribution um, with e-movies from our university. So in hindsight, um, there are 61 universities um, in Chile, uh, which is a mixture of public private universities. There are 43 professional institutes, uh, 44 technical uh, formation colleges. Uh, the difference between the two are mainly about uh, how long the programs um, exist. Some are two, some are one, others are up to three or four, where most of the university um, um, courses and programs last over five years. As you can see on screen there, the number of um, total students approximately, that's been data taken 2019. And more specifically about the, um, uh, I guess, the context in terms of uh, exchange programs, um, be it regular programs, so taking the whole um, course um, or uh, mobility. I want to concentrate on the mobility um, part of things there. Um, uh, Pre-COVID, um, obviously the population uh, in general um, in Chile is, is touching on the border of um, 18 million, uh, 18 to 19 million. Um, and the numbers um, have been growing in terms of um, you know, the amount of exchange um, that we've been able to, to have throughout the years, which has um, been great. Um, but obviously, like most, into COVID and things change. Um, a bit about my university in particular, uh, Universidad Católica de la Santísima Concepción. So we um, were founded in 1991 by the um, ordinance there of Archbishop of uh, the Santísima Concepción. Prior to that, uh, we um, were successor of the regional campus of Pontificia Católica of Chile. Um, so as you can pretty much figure out, we are this year turning 30 years and 50 years respectively, but um, the focus here is on the Católica de Santísima Concepción. Um, like most um, Chilean universities, um, but not all, um, uh, are accredited, we are accredited there. And um, we have spread out um, within two specific um, um, provinces within the region um, of Bio Bio and Nuvle, uh, which is in the south. So we have two campuses in Concepcion, uh, three branches in the province of Bio Bio and uh, one in Chiyan, which is the capital of uh, the Nuvle region. Um, in terms of numbers quickly, um, approximately just over 14,000 total number of students, uh, 10,000 um, undergraduate students, three that belong. We actually have a professional technical uh, program, uh, which is our strong emphasis and focus for the government here in Chile to promote and enhance um, in terms of the um, opportunities that are shared within those particular programs. Um, 250 students are approximately a, uh, the, uh, participating in master programs, um, 30 doctoral programs, and faculty staff, meaning teaching, um, approximately 520. So we're a fairly young university, though given the um, location, obviously our areas of focus are of sustainable um, coastal development, um, focusing the biodiversity, environment processes, production, and, and sustainable technologies education uh, from a in a context of vulnerability 
um, interculturalism and indigenous obviously is, is an issue here. We we are one of the regions that have a um, large population of indigenous um, um, students, whether they declare that or not, but the, it is a reality. Um, and uh, growing areas of water resource, energy and sustainable um, technology. Now, out of those numbers, um, and this leads into nicely as what I'll be presenting, um, with regards to mobility, generally speaking in Chile, um, like I dare say most um, LATAM or even um, globally, still represents a very small portion pre-COVID of students that were going out. Um, so it was, you could call it maybe um, not inclusive at all. Um, it was always dependent on how much funds um, were available, what type of scholarships uh, the university were offering. And in our case in particular, we had a hef, um, heavy focus on how to increase our outgoing um, number of students because of the reality that most of them were first generation and um, tend to come from the uh, medium to lower social economic um, strata. So, so it was very important from, from our point of view to analyze the new forms of exchange opportunities, find new scholarship opportunities, strengthen current partnerships, um, capacity building uh, for online teaching, which is what we um, ended up doing that last year, like most universities. And as James mentioned it uh, previously, we had to kind of like, um, like most, I think, uh, react quickly. We have uh, and and how and manage and balance this whole new reality of will we have an office <laughs> to work with? Will we have students to to promote? How are we going to do this? Um, because if we have a focus of that old mentality of that the exchange, then we had to look at new ways of diversifying the way that we send our students out um, or receive. So in that sense, um, we were not set, we were caught um, in a process of um, preparing for online, but we were certainly not um, there yet. So to the, the first half of 2020, um, and as you can see the numbers there, we had to quickly look at um, um, finding those champions, as as mentioned, um, doing a quick survey of, um, you know, who would be interested in um, offering some sort of subjects uh, to then look at and to know who and what subjects, what availabilities um, were there to then be able to look for um, partners. And it coincided, um, interestingly enough, with eMovies, which we had heard about the initiative um, because we were members um, of um, OE since 2009 uh, but joined um, in um, and that's a typo there we actually joined in the first semester we had some students um, exchanging um, and so it tied in nicely and we thought well we have to join here because it ties in with our strategic um, way of diversifying the way that we can um, maintain and increase our our, um, our student body there in terms of going out and of course coming in, but just focusing here on, on the outgoing because of its relevance and importance for our, not only my university, but other universities that have the same social uh, economic uh, demographic of students uh, and population. So um, we enhanced our incoming and outgoing students numbers within LATAM, um, increased uh, non-traditional student prospects, which our I will say that our um, rector or, or president or vice chancellor, however you call them in different parts of the world, we were very fortunate that he um, is very um, supportive, uh, which I think is so crucial um, to anything that you want to do. Our um, our vice um, rector or vice chancellor for academia is Colombian and 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 before that was the director of postgraduate studies. Uh, we have really an international, uh, I'm an Australian living in Chile for many years. So we have this whole global mindset and, and our, our president as well um, is half German and, and act, is participating actively in all these um, networks. And he movies for us, he gave me the green light immediately. He said, um, obviously work it strategically and uh, begin to promote. So that's what we did. Um, and we started off, um, as I say, caught very off guard. So we had to move quickly. And um, the numbers there reflect that in terms of the virtual exchanges, we had more incoming 
for our programs. Um, and due to time, I won't show the video, but we had a excellent experience for one of our academics who um, absolutely loved the initiative, um, was so happy to have students from various parts of the world um, be part of her class and her class, um, funny enough, is talking about social innovation um, and working with community and looking at solving, resolving issues. So it was great from her perspective to have these type of students come in from various countries with different mindsets on how to resolve issues. So that um, finding those champions and not necessarily your, um, I dare say those, those PhD academics, but um, um, academics that perhaps are starting off their career that, and others that just want to be part of this journey. Um, for, and, and so we began to work with that, promote it with time. And again, um, the numbers reflect there in the second, uh, first half this year uh, with 53. So for four for 53 and in countries that traditionally were not necessarily our, um, what we thought were of interest uh, for students, um, so we have Ecuador, Colombia, a lot of them going to Peru, Bolivia and Argentina. We normally would have students just opting to go um, physically to Colombia um, due to the various opportunities and um, cultural aspects. Um, so it's very comforting for us to know that we can count on new partners. Um, and that has meant that some of these benefits, and if I um, can um, vouch for this um, fantastic initiative, it definitely increases um, uh, opportunities in cross-cultural awareness. It opens um, to a vast majority of students, allowing for that access, which previously mentioned was not available. Equity, for sure. Um, and it also allows the universities to adopt this um, whole mindset or shift of mindset into how can I begin to, you know, offer training for um, or uh, to our academics or um, fast track our implementation plans of um, um, virtual opportunities, because I dare say that this is here to stay. Um, and it's a fantastic, regardless if we, when we go, not if, but when we go back to um, physical ex into um, exchanges, I think that, that this platform is, enables not only those students, um, you know, this last part or second semester or last part of their programs, but you can introduce this earlier. So that means that your student can have that whole international feel during their whole career um, or program. So it's fantastic from our um, point of view. We've, we've absolutely enjoyed um, this experience. Um, some of the um, challenges, as mentioned, implement the sustainable virtual model. Uh, that means obviously um, having the technical capabilities to maintain this. Um, obviously, look at internally who is going to have that buy-in from faculty, how that how they will be incentivized if there is incentives. Others do it just for the love. Others uh, will look for ways of um, obviously having that on their records to promote their categorization in as they advance. Um, incorporate strategic um, members, also expand public-private partnerships um, with international work networks and expand promotion for technical and postgraduate programs. I think that is a, a challenge there um, to incorporate. I think it's a fantastic tool to promote postgraduate. So um, that's pretty much from, from me. Um, uh, thank you all and, and uh, welcome you to, to Chile, um, hopefully uh, participating in KE, which I'm sure David will mention shortly. So thank you uh, for your attention and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Steve, for uh, this great input. Um, I, I want to reflect on, on, on one of the things you mentioned. Uh, and, and first, I, I'm glad to see that the numbers are, are increasing quickly. And, and that's, I guess, supports that with mm -hmm. being caught a little less off guard and being actually yeah. the ch having the chance to pilot it once with you know, all the challenges it, it, it implies. But then with a second round, with a more consolidated approach, with, with uh, president support, the institutional support, I, I guess it, it shows that you can move up your, your, your records and that's very interesting. Uh, you, you talked about cross-cultural awareness uh, and that there's definitely something. I just want to mention the audience that we received uh, uh, formal recognition from UNESCO and including a, smart, a small uh, funding uh, envelope to actually develop an intercultural module. So as we know, uh, the experience is not the same as when you actually go and discover another country. We want to ensure that 
before they take their courses, each student that will be part of a bilateral mobility experience within eMovies, we will we are now uh, developing some kind of a standalone intercultural module, some kind of an introduction to you know cross-cultural awareness and specifically looking at how these manifestations can apply in the virtual learning environment. So trying to you know move from the implicit to the explicit in terms of their own experience in terms about uh, in terms of teacher strategy and knowledge sharing, students learning processes and, and actually identifying the, the different cultural manifestations that they will witness and experience within their courses. So I hope that it will uh, allow them to, to, to even benefit. So we have a couple of questions from the audience and, and I think we have a bit of time to take that. Uh, first question comes from uh, Luis mentioning that, uh, asking if there is an interest or an appetite to include virtual internship opportunities to the current offer. I can take that one. Yes, this is definitely, I mean, and we called it eMovies, uh, virtual mobility space, not for uh, student mobility, but for higher education. So we are actually considering now to expand the mobility kind of experience. Now we are focusing on students, but we are looking at faculty internship or a faculty mobility, I'm sorry. So uh, for example, allowing uh, teachers now that they sometimes were invited to travel and give a conference or, or even for summer school or these type of, of participation, we are trying to encourage and we will put together a, a, a number of scenarios where teachers could and faculty members could actually be um, working in, in, in partnership universities to develop and same for uh, internship per se, professional development. Uh, it could be people from the international office going from Chile to Canada or vice versa to just to, to get a feeling of what are the strategies in different parts of the world. So we are looking at expanding that. And we are also looking at expanding uh, with new regions. We have a pilot, for example, between Brazil and uh, Portuguese-speaking African countries, Mozambique. Uh, so we're, we're working in that space to do to, to explore mobility. Uh, we are working with the English Caribbean as well to see how things can be developed. So it's expanding, and who knows? It maybe some uh, Eurasian institutions might be interested to 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 touch base, and and that's something that we definitely hope we will be able to 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 share. One question for James. We have uh, Zoe asking, what financial support is needed for virtual mobility? You mentioned, uh, is it primarily social media promotion or what if you would have to put some efforts in supporting your, uh, your, the program, James, where would you actually uh, direct that, that uh, support? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's been the biggest thing um, for us. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, David. So the question is on, um, on, on the cost. Obviously, um, the budget is much less. We don't have to pay for travel and stays and things like that. But we did divert some of the money for um, uh, campaigns on information campaigns, just uh, making sure that uh, people are aware of the program. Um, not a huge expense, I'll admit, but um, at a time when the budget was really tight, spending anything on this was, uh, was tricky actually. Um, but yeah, just in terms of promotion, um, social media, and, and uh, I believe there's a web platform that we, uh, we started to work on as well. So um, yeah, that, that's just what I meant by the, uh, the, the budgetary uh, implications on this. Thanks. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, we also have Denise asking if you had a chance to diversify study abroad destinations. Uh, and before giving uh, giving the, the, the mic to, to uh, Steve, uh, I just want to finish by saying Steve mentioned CAIE. Uh, we will be hosting CAIE, which is the uh, similar to Eurasian Higher Education Summit, but focusing on our region and the Americas. It's a conference of the Americas on international education. Uh, it, the seventh edition is planned now with Chile as host country. Uh, so if you're, if today we kind of uh, raised awareness about, the, or, or, or you have some questions about virtual mobility experiences, our, how our region is actually operating and you need to learn more. All of the institutions who are part of the consortium will be at that conference. Uh, we, we, we had it in different host country, as you can see on the screen. And this year is Chile, October 19th to the 22nd. It will be a virtual conference. There's actually a, the, a, the call for proposal that is currently open um, so that you, you, you can visit CAIE website uh, and submit your papers. We are very keen to explore uh, and, and understand what are your mobility experiences, your virtual mobility experiences. So Steve, you were mentioning that 
you move from maybe traditional Colombia to Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, what would you see the possible next steps in the role in that going that within the Americas, or would you be keen as an institution to even explore with new regions? What, what's in there uh, for we, you if you look at we, short term? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We, and thank you for the question. We are very open to, and we foresee not only from institution, but regional perspective as well, um, in terms of internationalizing even further. So looking at new destinations is always on offer. Uh, we always are surprised in terms of English. English is not necessarily the the strong point as well. However, there are plenty of students that we find along the way that speak um, and possibly could help, um, um, you know, with non-traditional countries, but it definitely helps these platforms in finding them. So I encourage you all to look for new new partners and, and obviously lead to further research in, in, um, for academics as well. It's kind of like the first step. So it's great. Great. Well, th first, I want to thank you guys uh, for joining the, the session, sharing about your experience. I, I, I believe that we, we do have an interesting product, but uh, hearing from those who are part of, of the experience uh, really uh, testifies that it's actually working and that we still co have some challenges to, to, to deal with, but it's definitely something that's there to stay. Uh, again, the CHI conference has a boot in the Eurasia uh, virtual platform, so, so please come and visit. Our team will be able to ask uh, answer your questions, and we hope to host you virtually uh, in Chile next October. So James uh, and Steve, a huge thanks once again. Uh, see you all over there in Turkey and the region, and uh, we'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.